Well, hello and welcome again to Word for the Week, our online book study series here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. My name is Pastor Jeremy, and I am thrilled to be with you again today as we take a look at yet another chapter of Max Licato's book, Traveling Light. Uh, we are in chapter 11 this week, uh, which Licato, I'm sorry, chapter 12 this week, which Licato calls From Panic to Peace. Uh, the point that Licato's uh, trying to get at here is the impact of fear on our lives, how fear um, cripples us uh, in so many different ways. And um, if we're going to talk about baggage that we have to be um, willing to get rid of, then we're going to have to talk about fear because it certainly is baggage that weighs us down slows us in our um, our pursuit, our work, uh, uh, especially our kingdom work. And so we've got to be willing and ready to deal with fear. Um, in Licato's book, uh, he begins really right from the opening of the chapter, uh, talking a little bit about what what happens in a moment where it seems like Jesus is experiencing fear. Uh, and he goes to the moment in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is gathered with his disciples. He goes a bit further on into the garden from his disciples, falls to his um, knees, and he prays that incredible prayer. Uh, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, Father, but as you will. And Licato suggests that there's this sense of fear that we see in Jesus in that moment. On page 98, he says this at the bottom of the page. He says, Jesus was more than anxious. He was afraid. Fear is worry's big brother. If worry is a burlap bag, fear is a trunk of concrete. It wouldn't budge. And then a little bit later on at the uh, top of page 99, he says, um, quoting Jesus, he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup of suffering. The first one to hear his fear, Jesus' fear, is his father. He could have gone to his mother. He could have gone and confided in his disciples. He could have assembled a prayer meeting. All would have been appropriate, but none were his priority. He went first to his father. I'm going to kind of stop there. Uh, if you've read the chapter, you know that he kind of continues on with this, uh, this idea about Jesus' fear. I am in no way uh, today trying to necessarily argue against what Licato has said here. I just want to help you think about it in, um, in another sort of perspective. And the way that I want to do that is I want to ask a, a little bit of a question about this fear. So um, the question that I want to ask is, is Jesus ever afraid is he ever afraid? Is he afraid of the suffering of the cross of you know whatever it is he has to do? Is he ever afraid? Um, I, I turned to one particular um, uh, Bible commentary that I that I like to to look at often. Uh, it's called the NIV New International Version Application Commentary. Um, it is um, produced by Zondervan Publishing. And in this, um, in this commentary, uh, the writer here suggests something that I think addresses uh, perfectly where I'm trying to go with this uh, about the question of Jesus' fear. Um, he says this. He says, uh, Jesus goes away from the trio of disciples to be alone because he must plead with his father privately. Although having his closest followers near provides necessary human support. There alone, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. In this posture of abject humility, Jesus lays his life before his father in utter honesty and trust. Matthew reveals one of the most profound insights into the intimacy between father and son, in this time of prayer that lasts an hour, Jesus probably reiterates various expressions of his central theme, which accounts for the variation amongst the gospel writers. 
With harmless urgency and truth, trustfulness, Jesus lays his life in his Father's safekeeping as he calls out with tender intimacy, My Father. This continues Matthew's unique insight into the special relationship of Son and Father in the Gospel. Jesus pleads, If it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus is facing a real temptation the most severe of his life. He started his earthly ministry by being tempted by the devil in the desert. And he was variously tempted by satanic devices at other points in his ministry. The significant feature of the earlier temptations was the satanic attempt to deter Jesus from the cross. Now, at the moment when he is ready to accomplish his life's mission, That temptation is intensified to its maximum. This is the devil's last-ditch effort to attempt to convince Jesus that the cross is unnecessary. And I want to try to bring this all together. Max Licato seems to be suggesting Jesus is experiencing this fear in this moment where he falls and prays to the Father and asks for the cup to be taken away. Um, here the, the writer of the NIV uh, application commentary seems to be suggesting that it's a temptation that he's experiencing. And the question then before us is, what really is Jesus experiencing? I think probably both. Absolutely both. You know, we could first ask this question, can God be tempted? Well, you know, this would be one of the key passages that we would go to. To suggest, you know, that Jesus demonstrates he has a temptation. The temptation of wanting to say, you know what? Forget about it. I'm not doing it. I don't want to do this. I'm out, right? Uh, We also know, right, that Jesus went into the desert with Satan. Was tempted three different times. Uh, The first time, he was tempted to take stones. Make them into bread so he could eat. The second time, he was tempted to uh, throw himself off of a cliff and save himself. And the third time he was tempted to bow down before Satan and worship. And uh, and then Satan would give him as far as the eye could see. Um, So we do know that Jesus is tempted. Now the question then is this. Is Jesus God? Well, our answer is absolutely 100% yes. Jesus is God. Second person in the Trinity. He is of the same essence the ancient creeds tell us as the Father. Uh, The Athanasian creed. I'm sorry, the uh, Nicene Creed telling us that um, he is one of substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, right? He's one in unison with the Father. So he is absolutely God. Um, You know, you may have seen what's called the Augustinian triad. It's It's a triangle, and at the top of the triangle is God, and down here in this corner is um, the Son. And then over here is the Holy Spirit. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In the middle is just the, the, the Godhead, the title God. And what the Augustinian triad is trying to tell us is that the, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, the Father is God. But the Father is not the Son, the, the Father is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Son, and so forth. Jesus is God. Okay, so if God can be tempted and Jesus is God, then what does Jesus show us in this prayer? What is he really showing us? I think he's showing us that he is being tempted here, tempted to want to walk away. Um, But here's the crazy thing that we have to remember. It's also fear. He is showing some fear, but not Jesus the God. Jesus. Jesus, the man, Jesus. Remember, Jesus has two essences, right? He is both God and man. Simultaneously, at the same time, he is God and man, divine and human. And it's in his humanness, his manness, that he finds fear and temptation in this moment. And so, you know, is it possible that in this passage we're seeing God and God is afraid? Yes. But is God the divine afraid or is God in flesh as a human being experiencing all of the things that humans experience afraid? And, and, and of course, it's the second, right? It isn't God the divine. It is God 
in the person of man, in the flesh. As John said in chapter 1, he became, um, uh, he, became he took on flesh, right? Uh, the word was God and the word is God. And then the word becomes flesh, right? God takes on human flesh. So if God can be tempted, and Jesus is God, does Jesus show fear in this prayer? I think so. I think the answer is, at, at the very least, it's maybe. I think it's yes. So what is really happening here? I think we're seeing this real and present danger of uh, temptation. Jesus knows the temptation that lays before him. The temptation where Satan is saying to him, hey, buddy, you don't have to do this. Just, just walk away. And that, I think, would strike fear in any one of us. We know what our Father has asked us to do. We know what our Father has commanded us to do. We know what our Father has sent us to do. We know that our entire life uh, as a human here is for the purpose of giving my life so that all of God's people can live. And I think any one of us in our humanness, and Jesus too in his humanness, would be afraid in that moment. Do we really have the power, uh, the uh, confidence, the trustworthiness to go forward with this. That's why I love the NIV commentary where it talks about how what we're really seeing here is this incredible, incredible outpouring of trust between Jesus and his Father, between Son and Father. I want to read one more uh, little paragraph from the NIV commentary for you. It says, But Jesus has demonstrated a complete confidence in his Father's sovereign power and perfect will throughout, of his li throughout his life. So at this moment of his greatest temptation, he turns to his Father for guidance. Jesus has prophesied that he must endure the cup of crucifixion to accomplish redemption of humanity. But Satan still tempts him to believe that it's not absolutely necessary. So what does Jesus end up doing? He lays this temptation, this incredible temptation that says, you don't need to do this. You remember, you remember Satan back in the book of uh, Genesis, the very beginning, he goes to the woman, to Eve, and he says, did God really say that you shouldn't eat this? And he makes her begin to second guess herself what she heard the Lord say to her. And so then she's in a vulnerable position thinking perhaps she heard him wrong and she makes this terrible decision to eat when God said not to. This is what Satan's doing here with Jesus. You know, do, did, did your father really say you have to do this? This is crazy. You know, you can just walk away and that temptation builds and so does the fear. So it's interesting that the NIV commentary kind of ends its um, inf information, uh, it, the, it's, it's um, digesting of this passage this way. It says, um, Jesus lays the temptation out to his father, but he does not ask to shirk his destiny. He wants only to obey his father's will. This is the landmark example of honesty and trust, trustfulness in prayer. The father will not respond to the petition in the way requested, but it does not reflect any fault in the one requesting it. The father does hear the son's plea, it, but it is the son's obedience to the father's answer. And he would continue to the cross that brings salvation to humanity. You see that? Jesus prayed. And in that humanness that was afraid and tempted, he was asking God, can't you please just give me this other option? Can't you let me walk away? Can't you take this cup away from me? And God's answer in this moment was no. And we certainly, you and I have also heard God say no, right? And that can strike fear in us. What did Jesus do when he was in a fearful moment? He laid it back at the Father's feet. He says, okay. I'm deathly afraid of this, but I'm laying it back at your feet. And we're going to do this together. And so he lays this temptation out to his father and he goes forward doing what his father asks him to do. Uh, Max Licato talked about our fears in his book. Um, he said, um, uh, sorry, I just lost the page. He was talking about our, uh, the different kinds of fears that we experience 
he was uh, talking about uh, things like, for example, the, the gentleman that he, uh, he knows who has a fear of crowds. Um, he, has, he talks about several other different kinds of fears that come up, whether it be you know, a fear of, of something like heights or whatever else, or a fear of failure, a fear of pain. You know, whatever these things are, we have all these different types of fear. The question is, what are we going to do with them? What are we going to do with them? When we become afraid and we have this baggage of fear that just is, is, is overwhelming to us. You know, on the top of page 101, he talks about how like fear can almost feel like we're having chest pains, like it's coming in on us. Anxiety and fear just shuts us down. What are we going to do when those moments come? Well, David, right, in, the Psalm, in Psalm 23, he said, I will fear no evil. Well, that's an incredible, incredible statement. I will have no fear. I will fear no evil. Um, in another part of the Psalms, uh, Jesus uh, Jesus quotes this in the New Testament. Um, but in another part of the Psalms, we hear of uh, the Messiah who will come as one who will say, I will put my trust in the Lord. And that's what Jesus absolutely does here. He puts his complete trust in God. Does that mean that Jesus stopped being afraid in his humanness? I don't think so. I have to imagine Jesus went to the cross with just about as much fear as he fell in the garden. The only difference was he had made up his mind. He had made a choice. He has chosen to trust God regardless of the fear. In spite of the fear. That's the big challenge for us. Can we trust God? in spite of our fear, even though our fear exists. I know that's kind of a heavy thing to leave you with. Um, I want to remind you that God is excited to take on your fears. He wants to take them from you. And he would love that you walk away and never fear again. We know that our human brains just don't work that way a lot of times. And so, even in the midst of your fear, will you trust him? Will you have courage and encouragement and, and power and joy in the midst of those fears because you're trusting God who has proven himself faithful, who has proven himself capable? It's an incredible way to think about fear for sure. I hope you guys have a great week. Uh, I look forward to meeting with you again next week as we look at chapter 13. Um, until then... Uh, again, have a great week. We'll see you very soon.